Mr. Atkins attended the Missouri University of Science and Technology, where he received his bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science and specialized in cybersecurity. After receiving his bachelor's degree, he joined an internship at Sandia National Lab Laboratories, where he now works full time. In his 15 plus years at Sandia, he has worked on dozens of research and development projects involving many facets of cybersecurity at the United States National Nuclear Security Administration Laboratory. Please well, join me in welcoming Mr. Wilkins. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I, it's good to be back. I don't get to come back too terribly often. I do have family in the area, so every now and then I'm back in Oklahoma City, and I'm glad that I can actually uh, see the campus. There are a lot of things that have changed here in the 20 years since I have graduated, almost 21, don't tell anybody. It's an open secret. Um, but it's really good to see the school thriving, um, you know, especially with the pandemic. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone here. Uh, you have a lot of opportunity here, uh, and um, it's just good to be back. So where are my alumni? Anyone? No alumni? I, I'll, I'll raise my own hand. How about uh, computer science and engineering enthusiasts? Who is interested in computer science, engineering, IT, that kind of fun? Awesome. Good to see a lot of hands up. When I was going here, there were maybe four or five of us. Uh, so nothing wrong with the other uh, enthusiasts. Um, where are my juniors? <laughs> wait a second, wait a second. Juniors over here? Any juniors? Or is this pretty much all seniors, pretty much all juniors? It's like a wedding party. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess this side would be the groom and that side would be the bride. All right, where are my Linux users? Yes, there were a small cadre of Linux users on campus. It's good to see folks still running Linux. Uh, how about my faculty, my staff, my administration? Where are you? Sitting in the back, come on. Uh, good, good to have you here. And what about my security enthusiasts, folks who are interested in cybersecurity, physical security, economic security, security of any sort? Not quite, I see a, on the fence, okay? I see a very strong hand here, very good to see. And where are my seniors? Yeah. Woo! AKA soon to be alumni. Uh, it's been a rough couple years. I'll tell you that you have a little bit more to go, but the end is in sight before you're hopefully on the steps of the Capitol a couple of blocks north of here. So congratulations. Give yourself a round of applause. All right, now that I know a little bit about you, let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I grew up in a town named Hooker, Oklahoma. It's a location, not a vocation. So it has a funny name. It's a tiny little town in the middle of the panhandle. Um, only about 2,200 people live there. It was a little smaller when I was there, but it's like the second largest town in the whole Oklahoma panhandle, so there's really not very many folks out there. Um, the reason I mentioned I grew up in Hooker is um, I actually had internet access at a very early age compared to many. 1996 was when I got my internet access. Uh, it was dial-up. Uh, I trained up at 9.6 kbit, uh, so it was very slow. Um, but there wasn't a lot to do for me in Hooker, Oklahoma. And I got my first computer in 1992. Uh, so I guess I got internet access in 1994. Um, I was in fourth grade. I broke it probably 100 times. My neighbor across the street, 10 years older than me, became my best friend and helped me repair my computer just so I could break it again. I was running DOS 6.2 and Windows 3.1, if anyone's ever had any sort of experience with that. Um, but from there, I applied to the Oklahoma School of Science and Math, where we are now. Um, it just so happened that the director of admissions came through Hooker, and it was a random chance. I had never heard of it. I don't know that anyone else at, at, at the school had heard of it, uh, but I applied. I was accepted. Um, it was a very nerve-wracking experience to come down to Oklahoma City. I had never driven on an interstate before, um, all that other good fun. Uh, but here, I, I finally got my first formal education in computer science, uh, and to some degree, computer engineering. So Professor Dillard was uh, my computer science and computer engineering uh, professor for things like hardware architectures. Dr. Samatade, who was my advisor, uh, she taught me data structures, um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. I learned more formally about the things that I had been doing uh, and didn't realize it. So I got myself into a little bit of cybersecurity trouble when I was in Hooker, Oklahoma. Never got caught or anything. Uh, but it formed a very solid base for me to build upon. 
And I didn't really know I wanted to go into cybersecurity until I went to the Missouri University of Science and Technology. It was called the University of Missouri Rolla back then. I got my bachelor's and master's in computer engineering in 05 and 07. I took my first security course the last semester of my senior year as undergrad and really took to it. I had never thought about a lot of these things before. We were studying things like cryptography, uh, network security, and um, I was sitting in the front row. I was paying very close attention, and the professor uh, took notice of this, and she asked me, she said, do you have a resume? You seem to really like this course, and I'd never had a professor ask me for a resume. If you have a professor ask you for a resume, you should immediately be suspicious. Um, and what I didn't realize is she had a lot of contacts at Sandia National Laboratories, which is a US Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration lab. And she sent my resume off to a recruiter, and about a month later, I got paperwork in the mail for a US government security clearance. I didn't know why they wanted me to have a security clearance, and I put two and two together. I talked to Dr. Miller, and she said, oh yes, good, you got the paperwork. You're doing an internship at Sandia this summer. And I was all like, okay, twist my arm. So. Uh, Sandia National Labs has its primary location in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, our secondary location is in Livermore, California. And we do everything under the sun, science, engineering, technology, and math, primarily for US government customers. Even though it is a Department of Energy lab, we work a lot with other government agencies, like the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense. Uh, we do work for DOE. Um, and so I have been there since 2006 uh, full time. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. It lets me do a lot of different things in cybersecurity, and for those who aren't familiar with the field, it is, it is becoming more and more stratified, uh, stratified. There are a lot of different disciplines in cybersecurity alone. We'll go into some of those at the very end here, but I have been able to do things like look at some very complicated systems that are, have national security impacts. I've been able to uh, develop sort of system designs and architectures. One of the funner things I've done at Sandia uh, is I did red teaming for about eight years, which is playing the role of an attacker, actually attacking a real system, and then writing a report on how to use that to better defend it. So I think like an attacker. Um, that can be both a blessing and a curse. A lot of folks, like my mother, cannot imagine how to think like an attacker. But in security, there would be no reason to defend if there weren't people who were attacking. And so you naturally have to think about both sides of this. But my mom works at a small bank. I still bank there because, you know, uh, she can actually look at incoming charges and ask me if it's supposed to be there. And if it is, she approves it. If not, she rejects it. But she deals with a lot of old folks who have their social security checks stolen from them. And she cannot imagine how someone would do something to poor old Evelyn, right? But I'm all like, mom, it's money. <laughs> Attackers are motivated by money it turns out. Um, and so it's not personal, but she just does not have that mentality of how to think like an attacker. I do, but I don't act like an attacker. So I was mentioning earlier today, um, as we were touring around campus, I was all like, you know, what doors are open? What doors are locked? Are there security cameras? Where are they? Where are they positioned? I naturally see all of those things, and I think like an attacker all the time. That doesn't mean I'm going to go rob a bank, but when I go in to cash a check, I know what the security guard, where they are, where they're positioned, what you know, kind of gun they have, all that other good fun. It just comes very naturally to me, so it's a mentality as well. But uh, the systems that I work on are, are often controversial. There are things like national security systems, nuclear weapons, hypersonic weapons, um, classified systems used for intelligence purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to abstract that out from my talks, um, but these systems are necessary for one reason or another, and obviously we want to protect them from attack. Uh, and so I have different uh, skills that I bring to bear to do that. I will say that the lines in security are very blurry. So if you have an interest in cybersecurity, try to work with an established practitioner so that you can make sure that you're not running afoul of ethics uh, or actual law. Um, that can be a little bit uh, difficult. It is difficult to get permission to do things. But permission is much, much greater than forgiveness. Government officials, law enforcement, they don't really, they're not big on forgiveness. Um, and so think about this. If you are going to go into this field, try to reach out to a practitioner. My contact information will be at the end here. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, there are a lot of things and opportunities that you have at your disposal today that I didn't have. 
things like virtual machines and virtual environments that you can put all in one computer that you know, are segmented away from the internet so you don't have to worry about it bleeding over and you accidentally attacking something that's real. So let's talk really briefly about security in general. I think it naturally is intuitive to many people, but you try to put a formal definition on it. And I looked at the Oxford Dictionary and I did not like their definition. Of all places, I know, Wikipedia, um, I like theirs the best. Security is the protection from or resilience against potential harm caused by others by restraining the freedom of others to act. So the idea of security is someone is going to potentially cause harm to my system and I put things in place that restrict their ability to do so. They will find ways around those restrictions. I will have to find ways to put more restrictions in place, and at some point I have to continuously do this. It is a continuous process. You don't just stand something up, harden it once, and it's secure. And that's because attackers are intelligent and adaptable and flexible, um, and you have to anticipate your adversaries, and you have to stay up to date with the technology, and et cetera, et cetera. It is a broad and very dynamic field, and it's growing. Um, you know, it has a lot of different disciplines. I work with people who, um, they do physical security. Uh, and so they don't just do physical security, they're looking at like how can a certain type of sensor detect a certain type of person in certain types of conditions and et cetera, et cetera. It gets very far down into the physics. Um, I work with other folks that, that do threat intelligence and they, they essentially dissect attacks that have been detected and figure out what happened and how and all that other good fun. And so it's just very, very broad. It's related to but it is different from safety and privacy. So I like to keep an interactive audience. How is safety different from security? Any, any guesses, any hazards? I gave you a definition of security. What would you say a definition of safety would be, roughly? Protecting from harm. Protecting from harm. So, yes? Limiting your own freedom to act than others, yes. Is there a, an attacker, is there an adversary in safety? Usually no. I'd say the biggest difference is with safety you're trying to protect against nature, things like accidents, weather, fire, those sorts of things, typically not deliberate, whereas in security it is a deliberate act. You're trying to protect against someone from causing harm, not something from causing harm. Uh, what about privacy? How is security separate from privacy? I'm not gonna go into a long diatribe about surveillance capitalism. Yeah. Had to throw that in there for the seniors who are taking the ethics class. Privacy is more about keeping information about yourself to yourself and limiting its distribution. And there are some elements of that in cybersecurity, but by and large, security is more broad than that. It's about defending against attack and exploitation, whereas privacy is more about controlling information, right? So, uh, you know, they are related, but they are different. So, why is security hard? Well, first thing off, I can make a system extremely secure. What's the problem with that, though? Has anyone ever dealt with a really secure system? Ease of use, Ease of use. yes. Any other problems? Expensive. Expensive, inefficient, right? And so, if I have a system that is extremely secure, I guarantee you it's more difficult for the users to use that system. So it's a balancing act. There's not the same level of security that's required for every different type of system. My grandmother uses Windows 10 to exchange emails of recipes with her friends. Very innocent. At Sandia, we use Windows 10 in classified environments to draw weapons drawings for nuclear weapons. Not as innocent, but also a lot more security has to go into that, and therefore we're willing to trade that usability for the protections that come with it. The problem is, of course, they're both Windows 10, and so adversaries know this, and they will develop all sorts of attacks and exploits against Windows 10, regardless of whether it's my grandmother trading cookie recipes or a weaponeer drawing in you know, a CAD program for a nuclear weapon component. Adversaries are intelligent, intelligent and adaptable. We'll talk a little bit about some of the lengths that the adversaries that I have to defend against on a day-to-day -day basis go through, but you have to anticipate this. In other words, static, uh, security cannot stay static. If it stays static, the adversary has a lot of time to figure out what the problems are and exploit those problems before the defender can address them. It's difficult to measure. How do you measure security? 
Anyone take a guess on how you measure security? Yeah, this is a, this is a very open research question still. They've been trying to do it since the 60s and 70s in computer systems, and they just can't quite get it. So the fact that you haven't had a successful breach kind of is proving a negative. Maybe someone hasn't been attacking me. Maybe they have and they haven't been successful. How do I know? Well, sometimes I don't, right? You have to go into intelligence to figure this out. And then it's also adequately, it's, it's hard to adequately test security, right? Um, computer systems particularly are extremely complex. And so how do you know that you have adequately tested the entire surface of what needs to be protected or could be attacked? The answer is you don't. And this is why you're seeing all of these problems in cybersecurity because systems are becoming more complex at the same time, uh, uh, security needing to, to be bolstered. But the complexity and the, the breadth of the systems is expanding faster than our ability to secure them. Um, and it often has a political layer, and it's influenced by egos, right? So everything uh, has a political layer, but sometimes this actually gets in the way. It's sort of the antithesis of security. Um, and you have, to, you have to realize there's a human component to security as well, and you have to be able to articulate sort of your justifications on why you need to do what it is you need to do. So what is cybersecurity? You can think of cybersecurity as the application of security principles to information systems, digital systems, and et cetera, right? Um, again, Wikipedia had a great definition of what that is. I think there's an intuitive feeling about cybersecurity, but the problem is if you want to turn this into more of a science, you've got to have more formal definitions. And that really is one of the problem areas in cybersecurity is it's erupted so quickly that it's sort of treated as a point in time problem and they don't really do a lot of scientific and engineering rigor uh, to look at the issues in, in cybersecurity. Why is cybersecurity so hard? Has anyone ever suffered any sort of cybersecurity consequences in the room? Feel free to raise your hand. Pam, got one in the back, got one over here. Maybe it was your password got stolen. Maybe someone hacked into your email and used that to reset some passwords for a financial system. Maybe it wasn't quite that extreme. Um, money out of the bank. How did you resolve that? So Visa covered it, right? You had to change cards. I've had to do that. I travel a lot for work. They know I'm on travel. My card gets essentially breached. Someone skims it, right? I'm eating at a restaurant by myself. That's a pretty good indicator. Um, it's a corporate card. That's a pretty good indicator. I've had to go through three or four corporate cards in the last five or six years, right? So it happens no matter how, how, much, how hard you try. Any other sort of cybersecurity problems that others have experienced? And get, Pam, my guess is that you didn't type out your credit card number and wave it in the air, right? You're, you're a, Yes, very careful, and so, yeah. So, okay, the typical laws of physics do not apply to cybersecurity. They do apply in physical security, right? So guards, gates, guns, door locks, sensors, cameras, all based on physics. Physical security is also a little bit more intuitive than cybersecurity. If I wanted to secure this room, it's a physical volume, if someone were to get access to this room, I would be e easily able to tell if they're in or out, right? Cybersecurity, not so much. There's www.ossm.edu. That's open to the public, but the internal network isn't. So there's automatically a blurry line, right? Physical security is much also easier to deal with with the human senses. I can't connect an ethernet cable to my brain yet. Elon Musk might change that for us. I don't know, hopefully not. I, I would not be his guinea pig. But um, I can't really use my human senses to interact with computer systems at a low level. As a graphical user interface and a command line, sure. But what's going on under that hood? Extremely complex. I have no idea. I have to dig really hard to figure out what's going on there. Um, so it's also subject to the disruptive advances in, in technology and society, right? Cybersecurity doesn't stay static by itself, but the technology People are now carrying you know, phones that are ex massively more complex than anything we had in the 60s and 70s, even if the US government spent tens of billions of dollars on it, right? Um, however, a computer that's sitting in a room crunching numbers 
has a different societal impact than a computer that is on me all the time and essentially can track everywhere I go and knows where I like to eat and what I like to do and who I talk to and what my location is at any given moment and what airline I fly and et cetera, et cetera, right? Like all of that, the use of technology is making cybersecurity more difficult even if defenders not only keeping up but improving security over time. The principles of attack and defense also change. Like I said, adversaries are intelligent and they're adaptable. So they're also very motivated. So they will, they will find ways to get in using techniques that didn't exist yesterday or an hour ago or a year ago, right? And so you constantly have to be on top of this. In physical security, that's not as much. Yes, you have more efficient cutting torches these days than you did 30 years ago, but I can also look at the material properties of a door and figure out if that door is susceptible to the you know, better advanced uh, cutting torch. The digital equivalent of that is, is nowhere near, right? I cannot compare them apples to orange, or apples to apples. It's more apples to oranges. Like I said, it's difficult to robustly test. It's nearly impossible to measure cybersecurity. I can measure physical security and other types of security a lot better than I can cybersecurity just because it is easier for me to do so. It's less amorphous. Um, and the attackers, unfortunately, have a symmetric an asymmetric advantage. It is easier to break a complex system than it is to get a complex system to work and to continue to operate. So even if I do everything that Microsoft recommends to lock down my Windows domain or that Apple recommends to lock down my, my MacBook, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that it is going to be secure against certain types of attacks or against certain types of adversaries. That's just not the way it works. The adversary has the asymmetric advantage because they essentially determine the vector of the attack, when the attack will take place, how the attack will uh, take place, and they constantly have this ability to probe systems, learn about them, figure out how they work, and uh, develop attacks specific to that system or broadly that can be applied to that system. It's also treated as a cost center. It does not generate revenue for companies to have cybersecurity. Unless you're a cybersecurity company like Symantec, um, Cybersecurity is, oh yeah, we gotta spend all this money and all this time inconveniencing our users to get you know, uh, their work done so that we can be secure. It is looked at as a cost by uh, folks in, in the organizational structure than it is a, a uh, revenue generator. So these are some of the reasons. There's a huge variety of reasons. There's actually, from a game theoretic perspective, a whole analysis of cybersecurity. Um, and, and they essentially look at this as a attacker versus defender game, and they, they come up with models and things of that sort. Um, so some of the common problems that we have in cybersecurity, unfortunately, have been around for 40 years, maybe even 50 years. Who's ever heard of a buffer overflow? Okay, so a few of you have. That's essentially a logic problem where you ha you're storing some data and the attacker comes along and says, well, I'm going to store a little bit more data than you're expecting. And that data starts writing into code sections that the computer then executes. So you're executing data as code. The user supplies that data. The attacker supplies that data. And so I can convince a computer to execute as code what should be treated as data, right? That problem has, has been known now for 50 years. Um, what are we doing about it? Well, we've developed some techniques, but there's still some of these major, major uh, exploits that come out that are all based on some of these old logic flaws from 50 years ago. That is very counterintuitive because people think cybersecurity operates at just an extremely fast pace, and it does, but essentially you're taking the same Lego pieces and you're just building a new attack weapon out of those pieces every time. And then that attack, of course, gets detected, and remediated and there are detection mechanisms, you tear that all apart and you build those Legos up in a different way. It's kind of like a biological problem with, with viruses that morph, right? I'm now vaccinated, but I have a virus that's found ways to mutate to get around those protections, right? This is kind of the same thing, except it's not naturally occurring. This is something that is all driven by human beings. Uh, debug interfaces. In order to make systems work, you have these engineers that have these interfaces that tell them about the low-level operation of the system. And that's great. They gotta have them in order to make the thing work, right? They gotta test it before they, they sell it. 
Well, they forget to turn those debug interfaces off. Or they turn them off, but they don't turn them off in a robust way. And the attackers come in and they take advantage of those debug interfaces. Similar are back doors and supply chain issues. So unfortunately, a lot of people who build information systems, they kind of want to have a sort of a god mode <laughs> built in to whatever product it is they're building. Um, oftentimes they'll say, oh, this is for technical support reasons or whatnot. Um, we're getting better about detecting those back doors, but sometimes they get really clever in the way they engineer them. It's not just a password that's hard coded in the code that sticks out like a sore thumb. Sometimes it's a lot more elaborate. You set this variable, you hold your hand this way and do a little jig and now you're in as the administrator. Supply chain is an interesting issue because um, if you look at how computer systems and information systems are built, we rely on a lot of chip fabrication and system integration in foreign countries that may not necessarily politically be our allies, right? Even if they are our allies, it turns out allies spy on each other. This is something most people outside of intelligence fields don't really realize. Um, and so they're actually sneaking problems in to systems that they have been contracted to fabricate. But now they know that they have a way in once this system winds up in a sensitive location, they will be able to essentially use that supply chain vector to get a back door in despite their best efforts of the defenders to prevent uh, you know, security breaches from, from happening. I could go on and on and on about these, right? I can tell you that excessive permissions are still a problem. You would think that these days people would, administrators would be able to look at the permissions that the average user has and be able to analyze that and figure out, hey, this person shouldn't be able to access these resources or these you know, files or reports. Turns out that's a really hard problem when you're dealing with tens of thousands of users on a lot of different computers with a lot of different roles and responsibilities. And it, if you turn that access off and someone starts yelling at you and they happen to be a CEO or a vice president, your day is gonna be very bad. And so there are a lot of conflicting factors in cybersecurity that you have to take into account, even on the things that should be easily done. Right click, properties, go to permissions, shouldn't have access to this, remove. Five minutes later you get a call, someone's upset. Right, um, And so these are just some of the types of issues in cybersecurity that you have to deal with. Totally not an exhaustive list. And I would say that 90% of those have been known for at least 30 years. Um, and the, the problem's getting worse before it's getting better. So I wanna talk a little bit about cyber physical security. So it turns out, oh, up until, you know, I'd say several years back, cyber physical security was very niche. You have these things called industrial control systems. Uh, you can control them on a computer, but they control a physical process, something that's happening in the real world, right? So you have sensors, you have actuators, uh, and essentially you say, okay, what's the, what's the temperature of this boiler over here? I'm refining oil. What's the temperature of this boiler? okay, it needs to go up by a degree, so you have a, an actuator that opens a gas valve up a little bit more, adds a little bit more heat to this, the sensor says, okay, now it's in the right place, and you're balancing that. You can have a human doing it, but it's easier to have a computer system do it. It's more precise, right? It's not turning knobs and you know things like that. Um, and so these industrial control systems have existed for a long time, but now you're, you're seeing a consolidation of industrial control systems with corporate IT systems. They're hooking the two together so that that way someone can sit in their office or these days work remotely and be able to change the temperature on a boiler in a, in a refinery. Can you think of any negative consequences that might happen with making these types of changes thousands of miles away from the refinery? I sure can, right? Um, especially if I can cause that thing to explode. You probably don't want an explosion in an oil refinery. And so one of the areas where uh, cyber physical security um, is, is becoming more popular is it's called IOT, the Internet of Things. You may have heard about this. It's hooking all the stuff up in your house, you know, your deadbolts, your door locks, your windows, your air conditioner, all that other good fun, right? Your, your refrigerator will tell you if you're running out of milk, right? Um, you know, used to be I would just open the door right before I went to the grocery store and hey, look, I'm running out of milk. I'll, I'll be sure to get some milk. Um, but you know, these days you can check all of that remotely. One of the areas that is a good demonstration of cyber physical security is a hotel lock. 
I'm staying in a hotel. Fortunately, it didn't have this lock on it. Um, but you'll notice this thing is pretty beefy. Has anyone ever seen one of these on a hotel or other door? So you have something similar on your, on your residence hall door, right? Um, OK, well, I did, right? Um, but if you actually, I, I bought one of these. If you actually buy one of these, it's beefy. I mean, the thing has a lot of metal in it, right? And what they're trying to do is they're, they are anticipating that as a door lock, its primary purpose is to keep people out of a room, right? So they're expecting someone to, you know, like, like butt the door with their shoulder or use a ram or something along those lines. The thing is, is extremely beefy, right? However, there's no key to it, not a physical key. There's a card, right? Um, now you've just entered my world. Before, I don't really deal with locks, although the lock picking lawyer on YouTube is fun to watch. Um, I don't really deal with locks unless they have an electronic component. So if you were to disassemble this thing, this little printed circuit board with all these cool little components in it is, is inside of this thing. Of course, it reads the card. It does a whole bunch of different algorithms and stuff to determine whether or not this, the card is valid and supposed to let the person in. Um, and it's not just the card that they assigned you. It's the cleaning crew. They obviously have to be able to let emergency personnel in. Um, and so the, it accepts multiple cards, right? Well, part of the problem is there's, it's hard to see here. There's a tiny little port right there. If you feel on the bottom, you'll see that it's there. If you aren't looking for it, you would never even notice. The problem is this thing has a battery in it. What happens if the battery dies? I suddenly can't get into my room. You notice there's no physical key, so it's not like someone with a key could come along and open it for me. So they put this port on the bottom to not only provide power, but also to program it. This is on the outside of the door. This isn't on the inside of the door. This is on the outside of the door that faces the hallway that is, you know, in a hotel is open to the public, right? So someone took this board apart. They did a whole bunch of stuff. They determined that it, it stored a 32-bit value in memory, and that value could be read out of the memory without any permission from this port and could be replayed back to this port to tell the lock, I'm an emergency personnel responder, open now, right? So a demonstration of this, they used a little single board computer called an Arduino. I don't know if anyone in robotics especially has used an Arduino. Very easy to program. They cost a very little amount of money. But they developed an attack to pop open any one of these. And there are millions of these probably still out there. But um, they've been phased out, obviously. There's no way to upgrade this either. The only way to, to solve this vulnerability was to buy a brand new lock. So here's them demonstrating this attack. That's their Arduino single board computer. There's the port. Doors locked. So they plug, well, they plug that in to the port, and then they apply power to the Arduino. The Arduino runs a small program, once he applies power, that just reads the value and repeats it, and he opens the door, right? This is extremely simple compared to what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's still, nevertheless, imagine the consequence of this, right? Um, that code is available online. I'm not recommending at all that you start breaking into hotel rooms. <laughs> you will get caught. That is called breaking and entering. It is illegal. Um, the hotel proprietor will file charges against you. Um, and potentially, you could get you know, punched or shot by the person who's inside and is surprised by you opening their door. Um, but if you, if you are suspecting that that lock is going to protect you, it's not. I got bad news for you. If you put the little latch and you turn the little thing, there are ways around that too. There's no silver bullet in security. The question is, how much does it take to keep an attacker out based upon the consequence of them breaching the security and doing something that I don't want to do. If it's small, I'm not going to spend a lot of time and security on it. I'll go buy a little master padlock that is susceptible to a you know, real quick 
you know, shimming attack or something. If it's major, if I'm storing nuclear weapons in there, I'm gonna buy locks that you probably wouldn't, you know, spend money on as an average consumer and probably aren't even available to you because it's worth that, de that delay mechanism for an adversary who gets up to that point to delay them up to a period of time so that I can get a guard force in there and neutralize them as a threat, right? Okay, real quick, let's talk a little bit about history. Who has heard of the ARPANET? Yeah, cool, all right, I'm, I'm sort of surprised. The ARPANET is the predecessor to the internet. It was started in 1969 by the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, which is a branch of the US Department of Defense. Um, and they connected together, oh, you know, five or six universities, national laboratories, DOD sites, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone knew everybody. They didn't even need a directory, right? Everyone knew who to call if they had a problem with a computer that was on the ARPANET and all that other good fun. So it turns out that TCP IP, if you've ever heard of that term, uh, TCP IP was, was created in the 70s, early 70s, um, to allow computers to more easily talk to each other. This was at a time when computers had, essentially they were, they were, they were single purpose machines and oh, well I'm using a, a PDP-10 and you're using a VAX system. We have a totally different hardware architecture. We can't run the same programs. There's no compatibility between these two. TCP IP allowed them to do that. 1971, it took two whole years for the first virus to show up. It was called Creeper. All it did was infect a system and at the login prompt, it just had a little ha 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 thing. It did, had no malicious intent whatsoever, right? Fast forward to 1989, well, actually we'll go to 1986. So ARPANET's still the thing. These folks, uh, Hess, Brzezinski, and Carl, uh, were working, they were German, but they were working on behalf of the Russian government, and they were breaking into systems on ARPANET using um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California as a hop point, and a guy named Clifford Stoll uh, found them doing this, tracked them down, and eventually testified against them, and they were convicted, right? So this is kind of the first major, there's national security implications to this. It made the news, right? It was a big deal. 1989, ARPANET became the internet. It was available to the public. It was available to the commercial space. It took no time at all. The Morris worm in 1989 actually did damage. Um, it self-replicated across the internet. It did damage systems, um, and they had to have a whole, you know, like, effort, they had to coordinate everybody. They're still using TCP IP in 1989. We're still using TCP IP today. Legacy roots, one of the major problems in cybersecurity is you can't rebuild the entire internet all at once. You're using it while you're upgrading it. And I can't just have people completely change standards that are, that are more secure. It's just not possible, right? Um, the Morris worm, Moonlight Maze, was a very interesting thing. Uh, essentially, the Chinese attacked a variety of, of US government uh, systems. 1999 was kind of the big Melissa virus. That was the first one where a whole bunch of individual private people started to become affected. Um, Code Red and NIMDA took down the internet. There's just no better way to say it in 2001. Very rapidly propagating uh, virus. Titan Rain was a, another um, espionage type uh, incident against the US government. Um, 2008 was a watershed moment. Russia and Georgia, this, not, not the state of, US state of Georgia, but the nation of Georgia, um, were going to war. And Russia said, wouldn't it be nice to totally disrupt their economy and their government operations, just you know, to make it more difficult for them to attack and do logistics and people not know what's going on so a couple of weeks before they invaded Georgia, they essentially took down all of the government services that were available to the public um, that were run by the Georgian government. Um, and that was kind of a watershed moment. We know from now on that that is going to be the case. Going forward before a physical conflict, you're almost guaranteed to have a cyber conflict. Look at what's going on in the world today, right? Russia has a bunch of troops amassed along the border of Ukraine. And just today or yesterday, the Department of Homeland Security was warning financial institutions across the world to be on the lookout, right? There's intelligence behind this that says, you know, et cetera, et cetera, they want people to be prepared. I don't know how they're gonna be prepared more than they are now, but, um, you know, 
we have these watershed moments. Operation Aurora actually attacked a bunch of private companies, including Google. It was a very watershed moment. Um, Google has some very good cybersecurity operations. And um, you have to worry about that, right? But 2010 was the big one. 2010 was something called Stuxnet. Who's ever heard of Stuxnet? Those industrial control systems I was talking about can be used to refine uranium and turn uranium hexafluoride into fissile material to develop nuclear weapons. Iran was doing this. A lot of governments across the world did not like that. So they developed Stuxnet. Stuxnet was an advanced worm that um, essentially disrupted that process, made it very difficult to figure out what was going on. Um, so, you know, I won't go into too much detail here, but this is 2010 up to the point for the rough timeline. There's a bunch of different, uh, you know, attacks. But up to this point, you just see an exponential increase in the, in the amount of attacks and the severity of the attacks. And the consequences are only getting worse. The more we digitize things, the more the consequences of attack are going to be worse. Solar winds was something I had to work on. Um, that was not a pretty day for anybody. Essentially, the Russians found a way to hack a company who had products installed in a lot of different agencies and, and private companies and et cetera, and they used that supply chain attack to get access selectively to whoever had that software installed that they wanted to breach their networks. That included a lot of agencies that I work for. Um, the Colonial Pipeline was also one where you actually had ransomware physically take down a pipeline and cause gas prices on the East Coast to skyrocket. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Stuxnet. This image was released by the government of Iran. Looks benign enough, but these little squares here, it's a grid, was enough information to essentially program Stuxnet on how to effectively destroy centrifuges that were uh, refining uranium hexafluoride. Um, they used that, they coded it into Stuxnet. Um, oh, uh, anyhow, they coded it into Stuxnet. Uh, it was a very advanced worm. At that point, Symantec said this is the most advanced thing we've ever seen. Fast forward to the solar winds attack. It, they estimate it took 10 programmers two to three years to do Stuxnet. The solar winds attack, which I won't go into too much time since I'm running out of time, uh, details since I'm running out of time, they estimate, Microsoft estimates that thousands of engineers worked on the sunburst attack against solar winds. So just in the last few years, 10 years, decade, we went from 10 programmers, two to three years, to thousands of programmers in the same amount of time, just in complexity. Solar, or solar winds sunburst is infinitely more complex than Stuxnet. Where's it gonna go from here, right? So with that, since I'm running out of time, I won't worry about the rest of the material. If you have any questions, I will try to take a few. If you don't have a class after this, I'm willing to stay here as long as I can today. Um, also, you can get in touch with me, atkins.william at gmail.com. Get in touch if you want to. Do I have any questions that I can answer in the next minute or two? What was working on solar winds like? I woke up on a Sunday morning and I roll out of bed. I don't really roll out of bed. I grab my phone, read a bunch of news. Um, there's a company called FireEye. They are an incident response company. They're very, very good, right? The US government calls them in when they need assistance. They had detected that their network had been breached and they did an entire investigation and found out that it was due to this SolarWinds product that they had installed and they, they essentially alerted the US government. Um, and so I went from sitting in bed leisurely on a Sunday morning, I'm not an incident responder for Sandia either, to, oh my gosh, is this something that's going to affect us or our customers? And I sent off an email, got an immediate reply. They'd already been working on it for the last 24 hours. And so I had to essentially assist them with figuring out if and how we were using solar winds, if we were, how to maintain operations with taking this software out and then maintaining evidence to see if we had all the necessary. So it, was, it took several weeks and we engaged with other customers as well and helped them. Um, we went pretty much unscathed, but others didn't. And so we were working with across the government to help others. It was a, it was a triage moment. The problem is these are only gonna get more frequent. And so at what point does everyone just burn out, right? There's only so many incident uh, responders and we just don't have enough people, right? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, hacking back. There's a lot of legal and ethical issues with that. Um, 
I would say that you're going to see people become more open to this idea, but you have to have strong assurance that they are actually attacking you. And the other thing is, oftentimes, the attacker's not coming from their own computer. They're hopping through several other people's computers, and so you would just be attacking a poor victim um, you know, who's already suffered a breach. Um, and so it gets really, really complicated, but uh, active defense is what that's called. And they're looking at a lot of the legal and uh, ethical implications of that. But I would say that there's more people open to it today than there probably ever have been. All right, I think that is all the time we have. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you.